Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Mm. Wasn't that just really special and heartwarming, that, that baptism that, that took place up there? You know, there is no junior Holy Spirit. And what's been happening in this, in this church, in this congregation, among our children has just been incredible. What, first of all, what Jessica and Kaylin have been teaching and instructing their children and how they put them to bed and, and how that they're going to bed with expectation that Jesus is going to visit them, that, you know, that they're going to have visions and stuff. So it's not something that's, that's new or foreign to them. But what Destiny and, and what our children's ministry is doing in the, in the back end of this, this place back there is equally as incredible but because that's what they're learning. There is no junior Holy Spirit, and the sooner that they're introduced to the Holy Spirit and what He does and who He is, the more quickly that they're going to be maturing in that realm and asking to be baptized because of the personal relationship that they already have with Jesus. We don't have to be 12 or 15. or there, There's no magic number because it's just happening younger and younger and younger. We're just seeing that in our children, and we're seeing them lay hands on people, and people be healed through the power of Jesus through the children. It's like, wow, that's amazing. Um, just recently, a, a young man came to me, and he was sharing some, some concerns about his young son that's somewhere uh, in the 7 or 8 to 10-year-old range, and, and, and he was saying, you know, these, these magic boxes, these iPads and, and the, the cell phones, you know, these, these kids at two or three years old can navigate these things. I have a, a three-year-old granddaughter that can do equally as well, if not better than me, on the iPhone. She can get a hold of it and just, it's like, are you kidding me? Let me see your phone, Papa. Get to, and she can navigate, she can go through, she can watch the videos she wants to, the, see the, go through the pictures, like, Unbelievable, way faster than I can. It's like at three years old, three and a half years old, it's like, oh my word, that's amazing. On the other side, on the flip side of that, what the, some of the information that's on those iPads, that's on those that they have access to, even by accident as they start flipping through that stuff, this, this young family that, uh, that was talking to me here a, a little while back was explaining, you know, our son blah, 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 and, some of the, and, and we've looked at the history and some of the things that he's been looking at are just absolutely appalling to us. I mean, we're not talking about hardcore porn or anything, but it's the stuff that leads to that, which so many men, young and old, struggle with. And so we, we were just taking a, a look at that, and, and he was asking me, this, this, this young man was asking me, so... You know, how do we deal with, what, what are we going to do? How, how do we deal with this? But the more they looked into it, they, they began to find out that it's like, oh. And, and uh, quit the, like, what are you doing? You're blah, blah, blah. You know what I'm saying? The first thing that we do so often with our children is just like, oh, panic. And then we just start to let them have it. You can't do what You can't. You, you, what are you doing? Why are you looking at it's like, you know, my motto is first, you know, seek to understand, then to make yourself understood. It's like, okay, so they looked a little further into it, and it's like, oh, he looked at this, because on YouTube it'll actually show you when you're savvy enough to check this out. Oh, he only looked at that for nine seconds. He looked at that for ten seconds, seven seconds that he spent there. The scary part is, that's where YouTube, that's the trail that it starts taking people on. He goes, oh, I probably shouldn't be looking at that. Oh, this is not what we're, we're learning back in the Sunday school rooms back there. It's like, oh, oh. So as they began to understand, they started to open up the communication with him. And uh, one of the things the dad says, I want him to be able to come to me with anything. And he says, so I told him that but he hasn't come to me with anything. It's like, okay. How then do we develop a relationship with our children to make them comfortable to come to us when they end up having issues or questions or struggles? 
and not worrying about, what are you doing looking at that? What? You know, when our first response is panic and you're in trouble and I'm taking that thing away from you and don't ever... It's about building relationship. I said, here's what you need to do. You need to make a very, very valuable investment into your son. You need to sit him down and begin to learn what, what he's interested in by engaging in conversation. That you, that you get this started even by asking him questions. What do you think about? What, what do you think about this? You know, just start so there's comfort in communication between you and your son. Right? I mean, how many of us would just run to our dad if he, we just got really chewed out, we knew we had done something wrong, we knew we were in trouble, and then he says, son, you can come to me with anything. You can ask me anything, you can tell me anything, I want to talk to you about everything. It's like, okay, first, the relationship has got to be established. You can't speak into someone's life that you don't have relationship with, even if it's your own son or daughter, because they're not ready to hear and listen. Does this make sense to anybody yet? It's like relationship is so important. Communication is so important. We, are, we don't want to be seen as the dad who's there with the, already got the switch ready, already got the... The, you know, the paddle with the holes drilled in it ready that's going to let you have it because you've messed up. Critical, critical, critical that we're sitting down, that we're spending time, that we're looking into that kid of ours or those kids of ours one at a time, looking into their eyes, hearing what they're interested in, what they're thinking about, what they want to talk about. So when they do have a question or a problem, they're ready to come to mom come to dad and have that communication, that open communication. And I want you to know that it's the same thing with our Heavenly Father. We do not serve a father who just sits up there and says, ah, you messed up, I'm going to whap you, you're going to pay for this. Uh, because there would be nothing but confusion. And so many people because of the relationship they've ended up having with their own father and or mother, end up having a difficult time understanding a loving God and a loving father because there's some confusion about obedience and love. Anybody been a part of that? Witnessed that? I see plenty of hands, and I've heard several amens on another one. I see that hand. I see that. <laughs> you know, it, it was my father, I, someone that I absolutely admired, completely obeyed, unless I was really sneaky and made sure not to get caught. But it wasn't until later years that, that I established a relationship where my father ended up becoming my best friend. In the beginning, I feared my father because of the discipline. I, I, I loved him. I wasn't, uh, okay, I should correct that. It's not like I was, I was really afraid of him. I was only afraid of him if I had done something wrong. I knew that I'd done something wrong because I knew he loved me. I knew he wanted the best for me. I knew he supported me, and he let me know that. He encouraged me, but there was kind of, uh, again, a, a little bit of a fear factor, which kept me being a little bit sneaky, kind of hiding some things. Like Adam and Eve, when they first got caught, what did they do? They wanted to sneak around and hide. They didn't want to just jump right up and confess. They wanted to sneak around and hide because God was coming and the voice. So, so it, it, it's a, a situation that until I was mature enough to understand how I was supposed to act, who I was supposed to be, if I had done something wrong, then I was a little afraid and kind of looking out of the corner of my eye, watching my dad. Anybody else <laughs> gone through that? Yeah. 
One of the things that we have got to realize, and everybody needs to realize, and that we need to communicate to people when we're talking about God is it's the goodness of God that leads people to repentance. The Word says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord, if we're acting out, if we're not walking in righteousness, then there is a fear and an awe of God. But we know, but knowing that it's His love, it's His goodness, it's the plans that He has for us that leads us to a place of wanting to repent, wanting to serve Him, wanting to obey Him, is His goodness and His love for us. There's a factor, and last week I talked just briefly about this. And man, how many of you were here last week? Was that not an awesome experience and a a great worship service and an experience? All all the guests that we had last week? (laughs) And how cool and what a big surprise that hardly any of you knew that that was going to happen. And look over there, I remember one lady came up to me and she said, I was like, I thought, wow, that looks like Marie Osmond over there. And she said, it is? <laughs> it just, just reminds me and makes me think. Remember when I was, last week I was telling a story about the, the FBI guys that were coming down the hall, two dudes dressed in suits, dressed to the max, like six feet tall, walking in stride, thinking, oh, no. Who? Well, there's one of them right there. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, let's welcome Jason. I'm sorry, I don't remember your name. Jason Miller. You, well, I know your last name, but I, I'm talking about your beautiful wife. Kelly Jenkins. Oh, Kelly Jenkins. I'm friends with Kelly Jenkins. Oh, that's why you don't look completely familiar. <laughs> wow, doesn't that make me look good up here? Huh? It's like... <laughs> welcome Jason and Kelly Miller. Okay, I give up. Jenkins. Kelly Jenkins. All right, well, we just want to welcome you guys. I think that was probably about three or four years ago the first time that you came and probably sat in that same spot right there. And we were able to welcome you. And I think you guys even got some prophetic words before the day was all over last time. <laughs> Maybe that'll happen again. Anybody got a word for these guys? Okay, Lynn, where were you when you quit right there? Yes, the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. What time is it? Nobody's worried about time? Okay. Well, what I want to do is back up because here's where I was going. Last week... I was talking a little bit about about David and him deciding, he figured out in his head, he wanted the presence of God to come back. He wanted to, back in the city of David, he wanted to get that presence of God back. So he went about it his own way, he started using his head. Instead of listening closely to the word of the Lord and the instructions, the very clear instructions that Moses had been given is how to move the presence of God into a new place. It was to be carried on the, on the shoulders of the, of the Levites, and there was very specific instructions. David thought about it. He talked to some council, and the council all agreed with him, so he listened to the voice of the people and decided in his own head, we can do this, we can handle this, and unfortunately that was a really bad plan. They tried to manhandle the Uzzah, tried to manhandle the ark, and was killed. The presence of God was not going to be moved, was not going to be going to manifest or be moved or manhandled, so he was killed, instantly killed. David was a little freaked out by that and decided, I better pay attention, I better back up, backtrack, and redo. So he did. Uh, The house of Obed-Edom was incredibly blessed. They moved the Ark of the Covenant in the right way as instructed and directed according to the voice of the Lord And there was much worship, much celebration, and the city was then blessed. Okay, moving into 
Samuel, now I want to uh, talk a little bit about Saul. Saul was David's, David's predecessor, and Saul was, was called, he was anointed by Samuel to be king. He had heard the, verse, the voice of the Lord. He had spent time on the, on the mountain with Samuel and some of the other prophets, and they came down. He was in, in, While in the presence of the prophets, Saul prophesied. You remember that story? When he went and he hung out, he, he prophesied right along with them. He felt the presence of God. He prophesied right along with the, with the prophets when he was with the prophets. When he's out of the presence of the prophets, Samuel was the prophet. He was the voice of the Lord in Saul's life. Everybody got that? Samuel was the voice of the Lord in Saul's life. Okay, I just wanted to make that very clear. Now, he had given Saul, when he became king, I don't know how many of you remember the story, after Saul had been anointed to be king, after he was called to be king, after they're ready to end up having the celebration, the coronation, the, to, to put him on the pedestal, to put the crown on his head, they're looking for him. It's speech time, man, we're ready to put this on your head. And, and he was nowhere to be found. He was hiding in the baggage. Remember that story? Some of you definitely. Well, that's how Saul thought of himself. Man, I'm the least of the least of, of, of this family, the least of the family. It, it, my father and my father's family, the least in the family of Benjamin. I, I am the least, the least. That's how he thought of himself. He was very, very humble and very eager to listen then to the word of the Lord, right? Yes. God rejects the proud, but gives additional grace to the humble. So if we want to end up getting the ear of God, if, he want him, if we want him to bless us, to hear our prayers, humility is the answer. Pride never. Pride never. He rejects pride. Okay, so Saul ha has come. He's, he's been in, in the position for a couple of years here, nearly a couple of years anyway, and, and, and he's been very successful because he's listened carefully to all of the instruction that Samuel gives him as the Lord gives Samuel the prophet instruction. So we all... Everybody with me here? Okay, I am in 1 Samuel 15th chapter right here. Well, he had been told it's time to attack the Amalekites and the King Agag. When you attack them, this is, I want all of this sin completely destroyed. I want nothing left living. Samuel made it very clear, the word of the Lord, God has spoken you, he's going to give you victory, and he wants nothing left living under King, Ag, King Agag's authority. So, very clear, nothing, not an animal, not a sheep, not a mother, not a baby, everything to be completely abolished, wiped out, land cleansed. So, what did Saul do? But Saul and the people followed the word of the Lord to a degree. But he took King Agag, this is the eighth, ver the eighth verse right now, he took King Agag of the Amalekites alive. He didn't kill him. He utterly destroyed all the people, the rest of the people, with the edge of the sword. But Saul spared King Agag and the best of the sheep, the best of the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were utterly and were unwilling to utterly destroy them all. But everything despised and worthless, they utterly destroyed. So Saul and the people that he was with decided to use their intellect, and it really didn't make sense to them. Now, why should we waste all this good stuff? This doesn't make sense. So the word of the Lord. We've got victory already. Now, this spoils. This doesn't make sense for us to get rid of all that. And man, this king begged for mercy, so we'll let the king live. We'll keep the spoils. And you know what? We've kept some really good stuff, so we can just use that as burnt offerings now. Isn't that just interesting how we can, we can hear a word, we can be pretty clear that we've had a word from the Lord, and, and we start moving 
in that direction, but all of a sudden we believe that we see some kind of blessing, which turns into a temptation for us to turn aside from the actual word that he's given us and to use our intellect a little bit. It's like, man, this just, this just don't make sense. I think, look at the, these are perfectly good. Yeah, let's kill that one. It's got a bum leg. Oh, let's kill that one. It's got spots. Let's, we start to sort through the words. It's like, yeah, this one makes sense. This one doesn't. Are you with me? Yes. We can engage our intellect and completely mess up and twist what God has given us and instructed us to do. And that's exactly what Saul had done. God was so disappointed with him, he sent Samuel back to him to tell him, you know what, you've messed up again. This was his second big faux pas. This was not first. You've messed up again. So let me, let me just read this to you. Let's go down to verse 16. Then Samuel said to Saul, because Saul started saying, well, we've, we've just kept the best, and our plan was, you know, we, we were going to sacrifice them. We were going to give them as sacrifice. It, it made good sense. Samuel said to Saul, be quiet. Like, shut up. This is not going to work for you, dude. I will tell you what the Lord said to me just last night. And he said to him, speak on, Samuel. So Samuel said, when you were little in your own eyes, were you not head of the tribes of Israel? It's like, when you came in with humility, when you were humble, when you were listening carefully and accurately and obeying my every word, didn't I bless you? When you were little in your own eyes, were you not head of the tribes of Israel? I put you over all of Israel. And did not the Lord anoint you to be king over the complete, over all of Israel? Yes, yes, yes. Now the Lord sent you on this mission, and he said, Go, utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites. Fight against them until they are all consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? Saul said to Samuel, But I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and gone on the mission which he sent me, and I brought back King Agag of Amal Amalek. I've utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took the plunder, the sheep, the oxen, the best of things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. You know, it's something that all of us, especially when we're younger and immature, and some of us, most of our life, are looking for somebody to blame yeah. when we end up getting the, getting the rebuke, getting in trouble. or so. I, yeah, but yeah. she made me do it. He made me do it. Even back to the Garden of Adam and, uh, Adam and Eve in, in the garden, we said, oh, it's that woman you gave me. <laughs> she made me do it. We've been looking for somebody to blame, but God's not interested in that. No, it's up to you. You're the one who's been disobedient. So here was his words. We're going to skip down to 23. So you, 22. 22 and a half. <laughs> the Lord, does the Lord have great, desire, great delight in burnt offerings, sacrifices? It's like, no. He's not interested in those sacrifices, especially something that you've taken that wasn't even supposed to be taken. It was supposed to be dead already. As in obeying the voice of the Lord, behold, it's better to obey than to sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Everybody say with me, witchcraft. witchcraft. And what does God think about witchcraft? Mm. Ooh, no, negative. Negative. For rebellion, when you have rebellion in your heart, when you rebel against the Lord, it is as witchcraft. When you rebel against the word of the Lord that God has given the prophet who has been put in charge, in authority over you, it's as witchcraft. Okay, listen to the next part. Stubbornness is 
as iniquity and idolatry. It's like, oh dear. Well, it's one thing to talk about rebellion, but what about stubborn? Stubbornness is as iniquity. Well, what's, a, what's a breakdown for iniquity? It's like, iniquity is just sin in your life. Stubbornness is as sin in your life and idolatry, which God completely is against and opposed. It means that we are setting ourselves in a position. Remember, I've quoted so many times uh, Jack Thompson. It's like anything that you have to check with before you can say yes to God is an idol in your life. Anything you have to check with before you can say yes to God is an idol in your life. If we become stubborn just in who we are and in our personality and in our, in our actions and in our obedience, that stubbornness is as idolatry. It's putting ourselves and our thoughts and the way that we feel above how God feels and what His desire is for our lives. Well, how does that feel? Wow or ow? Which one did you say, Dale? <laughs> Both? Now listen, you know, so Saul is pretty upset about this whole thing, and he goes, you know, I've sinned. I have sinned. But, but, I have another favor to ask of you, Samuel. Would you uh, accompany me up in front of the elders and help me to worship the Lord so I won't lose face in front of the elders. It's like, <coughs> Saul, if you had another chance, you just completely blew it because it wasn't about being obedient, falling on your face, asking forgiveness. It, 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 he just goes on and says, would you accompany, would you follow me, would you take me up in front of the elders of Israel so I can worship in front of them? Oh, that's what I said, Louis. Oh, my goodness. Saul, come on. I thought you were a little bit more mature than that. But the insecurity and the fear of people, the fear of man, what they thought of him, was still so inherent in his life that his last request to Samuel was, will you go up with me so I won't lose face in front of the elders? It's like, oh, man. It's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. I really should have brought my phone up. Somebody give me an idea what time it is. All right. Oh, we're in great shape. It's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. His love, the plans that he has for our lives. Ephesians 2.14. Let's turn to Ephesians 2.14. Let's turn to Ephesians 2.10. Not 14.10. For we are his... Word. Let's, let's back up to 8. For by grace you've been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We were created for good works, which we should walk in before them. God knew, established, and had a plan for your life. You were created for good works. We're not saved by good works. We're saved by faith, by grace, through faith, to do the good works, that he had established and planned for us before the beginning of time. We got it? How are we saved? Grace, faith, all of the above. I want to talk about grace here, here just in a little bit. I believe that when God 
You know, we, we all have callings on our life. When, when God saves us, there's a calling and a, and a plan and a purpose for your life, and it's to do good works for Him. Yeah. Everybody say good works. Good works. Important works. Because anything we do for him is important. Okay, now we're going to turn, we're going to jump back to this, but I want to turn to Revelation. Revelation 3, start with verse 19. Knowing that God has chosen you, called you for good works, that it's his goodness, his love that has called caused us, that's brought us to a place of repentance. We've asked Jesus to come into our life, or at least this is what's supposed to happen. Beginning in verse 19, as many as I love, Jesus speaking, red letters, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Anybody know what rebuke means? Express sharp disapproval or criticism because of behavior or activities, unacceptable activities. So, whom I love, I rebuke and I chasten, chasten, to punish in order to bring about improvement in behavior, attitude, or to restrain or moderate. So, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, therefore, be zealous. What is zealous? Zealous means to do it with zeal, to do it with passion. I mean, gung-ho, full of passion. So therefore, be zealous, be passionate about repentance. All right. We just call it passionate repentance. Because in verse 20, it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door. It's like, I I think that as I was kind of pondering and meditating on this part of the scripture right here. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. You're not just answering to the knock. It says, If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, it's like what was the problem that Saul had? The voice of the Lord he was not obedient to. It's like he heard the voice through the prophet Samuel, but was he obedient to the voice? No. Anyone hears my voice and the knock on your door and comes and opens that door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. Isn't that a beautiful scripture right there? If you hear the knock on the door, you hear the voice, you know who's speaking, you open the door and he will come in. I was talking about us fathers and our children, how important it is that we establish relationship, that we have communication, that we sit down at the dinner table and have, have a meal together and just and talk across the table as we build relationship with our children, as they know how much we love them and how much we value them and how important they are to us. This is what Jesus is saying to every one of us right now, if you will respond, when I knock on the door, you hear my voice, if you will open that door, I'll come in and we'll have a meal together. Me with you and you with me. And verse 21, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. It's like, to him who overcomes. It's like, we can ponder that one just a little bit. To overcomes, you mean to be brave enough to open the door? What do you think that overcome means? To, be, to him who's brave enough to open the door and let me in? Like, no, no, no. I'm going to take this back to hearing the voice of God, the plan and the purpose that God has for your life, Some of the training that comes along with the plan and the purpose that he has for your life. You see, once we open the door, God sits down and we get this conversation. Jesus sits down and we get this conversation. Holy Spirit sits down and we get this conversation. (laughs) Whoever's visiting us right there, I I believe that Holy Spirit is, is the entity. Jesus says, I must come that 
I must go that he comes. He will minister to you. He will be comfort you. He will be the one that leads you into all truth. So, you know, there is a, 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 a person of the Holy Spirit that can just sit right across the table and communicate with you. Once you hear the voice, open the door and let him in. And when we get to that point, when we are establishing that communication and hearing and understanding and our ears become unplugged and if you back up a few verses, the eye salve is put on your eyes where you begin to see what he wants you to see, hear what he wants you to hear. He starts giving you some direction and then some training starts because he's got a plan for you. It's like, I was talking with some people just a, a few days ago that were, were whereas a, a, a lady that was, has really, really struggled and, and uh, gone through a lot of abuse. And, and uh, we were talking about even just a few weeks back, some of the abuse that she had, had gone through had resurrected its, itself, where she had to deal with it again and go through some more layers. And, and they were asking me, or standing on the back of the church back, they were asking me, you know, why, why, how, how, is this, is this continuing? Why do we have to peel off another layer through this abuse? And I said, wow, oh, this just seems really clear to me. You know how, have you ever watched any of those uh, when someone, we have a cousin, Renee has a cousin, who's married to uh, an army ranger, who's, you know, ranger is the elite in the army, then they move from ranger to completely special ops to be a sniper, which is a whole nother level of crazy, all kinds of training, m testing mentally, physically, emotionally, wh wh how much they can take. There's just crazy training and step after step after step to a point I was watching some of this on a, on a video where these guys, they get all camoed up and there's this like watchtower and guys on the watchtower with, with binoculars that are, that are watching out over this field. These guys are all camoed. And there's a test to see if any of them can get, like it's over 100 yards, across this field to cross that line without being detected. Where it's just in, in camo, it's like, oh my goodness. So they have to be so, 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 so patient. They have to persevere. They have to forget about hunger and thirst and having to go to the bathroom and just like wiggle a fraction of an inch at a time, a fraction of an inch, to ever pass the test to be able to become a sniper. It's like that's a very elite test. But when God has an elite calling for your life, you're going to go through a whole different type of testing that has layer after layer and patience and patience and trials and trials for you to get through to be able to fulfill that calling because he's got something really important, really special, and really powerful for you to do. It's like our cousin, the, the sniper guy. So amazing, this guy. He, you know, when you think of an army sniper that's gone through all of this, and his family, he will disappear for two or three weeks. When he goes, he can't even talk about it. I would love to, to have sat down, I've sat down with him before, but he, I really can't tell you. I'd have to kill you. It's like, you know. <laughs> so, okay, never mind, never mind. Uh, he doesn't talk about that. That's one of the, one of the vows that he, he's taken. He doesn't talk about that stuff. His family doesn't know where he's at a lot of the time because it's so secret when he's sent off. But he's one of the most humble, gentle, sensitive li I figure it must be easier for those little guys to be able to crawl around undetected than us taller, bigger, <laughs> pass the test, you know. No. He was a very small, very gentle, though. You, it, it doesn't even make sense that that would be the desire of his heart. You know, the Word tells us, delight yourself in the Lord and He'll give you the desires of your heart. Delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. It's like, but He's the one that puts those desires in there. So somebody wanting to be, wanting to go through all of that training to be, you know, sometimes is not willing, is not willing to go through the patience, the perseverance, to go through everything that you have to do to actually serve 
what you're truly called to do, to end up having, are you with me still? Okay. It can be much, much, much. So I was explaining this to them, and I, and I, and I was saying, you know, this probably 35-year-old, really pretty young lady, that God has got something very, 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 very special for you. There's a mission. And when you get through all this junk and all of the layers are peeled off and you've gone through this and this and this, truly you are an overcomer, and it's because he's called you to something very special. You, after you have been through, and you are the overcomer on this side, now have authority over that situation, and God will use you because of the training that he's put you through to be able to deliver many, many, many women that have suffered the same kind of things as you. That's why you didn't just get prayed for, delivered, it's over, it's done, because you have no idea the process to walk somebody else through. Does this make sense? Yes. And I completely believe that that's what he was talking about right here. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches today. We're created for good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Flip now to Ephesians 4, 7. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7. Okay, I'm going to back up to verse 4. There's one body, one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. But to each one of us, grace, what's grace? Unmerited favor of God. It's the favor of God that empowers you to accomplish what he calls you to do, to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. So what I just described to you, what I've just described to you, is God, when God puts a calling in your life, and you step up to that calling, and you say, I'm willing, Lord, I've opened the door, we're having the meal. We've got the communication established. I just want you to know I'm all in, Lord. I'm all in, fully submitted and committed to do whatever you call me to do. He's saying it's his gift of grace established within you that gives you the authority, the power, the gumption to get it done. The word says, His grace is sufficient for me. His grace. Everybody say with me, His grace, His grace. is sufficient for, me. sufficient for me. Once more, His grace is sufficient for me. He gave gifts to the church, He gave some to be apostles some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, teachers. For what reason? For the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. We're called to good works, and that work is ministry. Whatever part you play of ministry, whether it's being in, in the administration, whether it's being the mouthpiece, whether it's being the hands and feet, whether it's being the financier, we're all called to ministry, to play our part in the body of Christ, to minister to that body for the edifying of the body of Christ, 
till we all come to the unity of the faith and knowledge of the Son of God, to be a perfect man to, in the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, one of the things that I've talked about over the last couple of weeks is how important it is that we know and that we're familiar with our word, with the word of God, with our Bible, because the enemy comes in just so often to just put a little twist, just a little twist and a little tweak. And then we look at our compass, and it's no longer pointing true north, so we're not really going to get to where we're hoping to go, because it's just been tweaked a little bit. So where we're headed is not where he's actually calling us to go because we're not following complete truth. Anytime a truth is tweaked, it's no longer a truth. We want absolute truth in our lives. And that comes by the study of the word, by the communication that we have with him, by submitting ourselves fully to what he has for us and to his will for our lives. No trickery, no cunning, no craftiness is going gonna, is gonna to trip us up, but speaking the truth in love that we may grow up in all things into him is, who is the head, Jesus Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, that's all of us. He's talking about all of us. We've all got something to contribute and give. According to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. We've all got a part to play. Each one of us is important that God has called us and we are important. We are valuable to him. And it's his love and it's his goodness that draws us in. And we just thank you for that. You want to, let's stand together. As the prayer team comes up here, if there's anyone that would like prayer for anything, for any reason, if you've never accepted Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, I encourage you, come, come, come. If you need a healing, if you just need prayer for any reason, the prayer team is up here for you. So let's pray together. Father, we just come before you with such thankful hearts, knowing that you love us. <laughs> let's just say it together. I know you love me. And I love you. I praise your holy name. And my desire is to serve you. I commit my life to you. In the name of Jesus. And together everybody said, Amen. God bless you, keep you, make his face to shine upon you, and give you his incredible peace this week. Have a fabulous week. And all you men, we'll see you Saturday morning.